Psalm 85, verse number 6 says this, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us mercy, O Lord, and grant us salvation. I will hear what the Lord God will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people, and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell on our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. The picture here is a picture of healing, a picture of renewal, a picture of restoration. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. That's revival in a verse right there, verse 13. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Help us, Father, as we look at this passage. Help us as we look at your word. Help us to add on to and think about uh, what we thought about this morning, but help us to expand on that, to think how we may be at a point in our life that where we may be at a point in our heart where revival is needed. And help us not to be like that person that says, I really don't need revival. Help us not to be like that person that says, I don't think revival is possible in my heart. And then help us to look at some other things tonight that may be obstacles for us getting to where you need us to be. We ask it in your name. Amen. Sometimes the problem with our heart getting in tune with the Lord is this idea that we just really don't think that we need revival. Sometimes the problem is we doubt that the Lord could bring us to a place where we could be revived. But then notice that sometimes the problem is deflection. Would you say that word with me? Deflection. And here it is in a nutshell. I don't need revival as bad as somebody else does. I don't need revival as bad as somebody else does. I mean, we send missionaries to foreign countries uh, where pagans live, where they worship Buddha or they worship some other false god or they worship bugs. And I was thinking about the islands this morning as Brother Larry read the the, the letters, and I thought about how oftentimes they have this form of religion, but they mix their uh, idolatry in together with it. And oftentimes these folks, islanders, are they're highly superstitious. We met this both in Haiti and in Dominican Republic where they have these different ideas, and you think that doesn't match what the Bible says, but they believe those things, and you think, boy, we need to send missionaries to tell those people that their idolatry and their uh, uh, spiritism, that stuff is baloney. But the truth is, oftentimes, the greater spiritual need is our own heart. One of the most frustrating attitudes during a season of revival is somebody comparing with somebody else and saying, you know, I got some things in my life that aren't lined up, but boy, I'll sure know something's happening when so-and-so walks the aisle. When we begin to compare our spirituality, and Paul talked about how dangerous that is. Paul said that when we stand uh, amongst each other and we compare each other to each other, Paul says when that happens, he said, it's not wise. 
God can show up and God can move and God can do great things in other people's lives. But if you're worried about somebody else, it's going to pass you by. Now, your husband may be a rascal and your wife may be a bona fide Jezebel. But friend, if God touches your heart for revival, you're just going to have to stop thinking about them and say, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God can show up. God can move and do great things. Revival church-wide is possible, but only possible when it becomes a personal reality. If every person focuses on their own spiritual walk, then revival can happen. It's a wonderful thing when revival happens collectively, but don't wait for somebody else and say, God, you're moving me, I'm moving. If you sit through a service and you think that somebody else needs it worse than you do, or as we mentioned already this morning, you think, man, sure would have been nice if brother so-and-so would have been here to get in on this one, then we really are missing the concept of revival. In Luke 18, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within, with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And he goes to list the list. They're extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And transliterated, that is, the sinner. Like Paul said, the chief sinner. The publican said, if there's anybody here that's a sinner, I agree. I vote for what that man just said. I am the offender. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For the one exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I read a story about a, a, an evangelist who was giving an invitation for salvation. And a lady walked down to trust Christ as Savior, and when she got to the front, the man started talking with her, in dealing with her, the, the evangelist was dealing with her. And when he came to the point where he was trying to deal with this lady about her sinful condition, she was halting. And she was arguing a little bit with the man, though she had been the one that had come for salvation. So he said, ma'am, I'm going to ask you to repeat this. I am a sinner. And she wouldn't say it. He said, I think you're going to have to go back to your seat. He said, I don't think you can be saved. She turned around and walked back to her seat. She had almost got back to the row that she was sitting in. She turned around and she came back up to the evangelist again. And she said, Mr. And she said his name. She said, I am a no good, rotten sinner. He said, ma'am, I think you're ready to be saved. And I honestly believe at that point that she may already have been saved. Deflection. When we think revival is possible, but somebody else needs it. There's another enemy to revival, and that is the enemy of delay. Would you say that with me? Delay. We started all the way back in the beginning. We said that one of the enemies to revival is denial. Where we say, you know, <laughs> not me. Did we say that? Did we say denial? Then we said, oftentimes it's doubt. You know, I'm so far from the Lord, I don't think God could do anything for me. And sometimes it's deflection where the Holy Spirit begins to convict us and we say, you know, I need revival, but, you know, I don't need it near as bad as brother so-and-so. You know, that brother Ray, he, that man needs revival. Not, a, not like me, you know. Delay. And here's the statement. I don't want revival just yet. <laughs> Would you say that statement with me? I don't want revival just yet. Say it one more time. I don't want revival just yet. And that's when the Holy Spirit begins to press you. And you say, you know, I'm going to do that. 
but not tonight. I'm going to do that, you know. <laughs> I'm all for that altar stuff, that invitation time stuff. And I'm going to do that, just not right now. And procrastination is a serious problem. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice. Sometimes we know that we need revival, but oftentimes we know that there's going to be a drastic change. And sometimes we are so busy enjoying our sin that we don't want to get our heart right with the Lord. And sometimes revival seems like something that would really cramp our lifestyle the way that it is. If I did get right, here's what I would have to do. And I just don't know that I'm ready to do that right now. They would be honest that they need it, but just not right yet. James says something about that in chapter 4. Verse 13 says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, sell, and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For what ye ought to say is, if the Lord will, we shall live. And do this or that, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Who gave you the idea that you have tomorrow to get right? I mean, we just bank on that as a fact. And the Bible says that that kind of boasting is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, and mark it down big and bold. This is not just talking about somebody that knows something. Oh, that'd be good to do. Boy, I better do that because that's going to be a sin because that's not what the Bible's talking about here. In the context, clearly it's saying when you understand that you ought to do something but choose to not do it because you think that tomorrow is a better day to do it, the Bible says that boasting is evil, and that evil is sin. That's what the scripture says. And there's a lack of urgency when it comes to our spiritual walk. And there's no thought given to the time spent walking in the flesh. I love something Brother Hiles said years ago. I heard him preaching a message, and he said this in a message. He said, you know, we have the wrong concept sometimes about sin. He said, because sometimes we just talk about how bad sin is. And sin is exceedingly sinful. And he alluded to that. But he said, the time that we waste sinning is time spent away from doing what God wants us to do. And we ought to consider the miss there. The time spent walking in the flesh. Do you know that not only walking in the flesh is time spent, but the crop that comes up after sowing in the flesh. The Bible says if we walk in the flesh, we will sow and reap to the flesh destruction. But if we walk in the Spirit, we'll reap from the Spirit life everlasting. Now that's not a direct quote from Scripture, so don't crucify me on uh, David version. The days that you live out of communion with the Lord... You get upset if your friend doesn't check in on you. You get upset if you send somebody a text and they don't respond back within the hour. What's the deal? Can I ask you, does it bother you to not hear from heaven? I'm just asking. Does it bother you to not hear from heaven? And the possibility when we delay that our possibility may be the last opportunity we have. You ever thought of that? You're going to go to heaven. If you're out of fellowship with the Lord and you die, you're going to go to heaven one way or the other. But I don't know about you, but when the Lord takes me, I want to be dialed in. I want to be in tune. I don't want to get to heaven like this. There's another enemy to revival, which is this defiance. Defiance. When a heart is full of rebellion. When a heart has become so calloused and so hardened. 
so ingrained in a sinful walk and a sinful life where we say, I don't want revival. I know this goes against, for, for the majority of you, this goes against every fiber of your nature. But I want you to say it out loud to hear how terrible it sounds. Sometimes we feel this way in our heart, but when we verbalize it, it sounds different. So I want you to say this with me. The phrase is, I don't want revival. Would you say that with me? I don't want revival. Isn't that awful? That's an awful statement, isn't it? Jeremiah 8 and verse 5 says, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth to battle. What a sad statement. No wonder God punished his people. No wonder, let's take away past tense and let's go to present tense. No wonder God punishes his people. When they say, what have I done? You approach somebody about something. What? And that's what the scripture is saying. Listen to Hosea 11, 7. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they called, though they called them to the most high, none at all would exalt him. A person that doesn't want revival is the worst off of any of the other four categories. They know that they need it, but they don't want it. They have become comfortable being backslid. They're comfortable with being cold. They're comfortable with being callous to the things of God. They're comfortable with being carnal. And it's a terrible place to be, and it doesn't end well because God's word says it doesn't end well. Proverbs 14, 14 says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. That's terrible. It is not the idea to scare you into revival because that doesn't work. You'll only come to revival when in your heart you agree with the Holy Spirit's assessment of you and you say, God, move. Let's read verse 5 together of Psalm 85. Verse 5. Are you ready? Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? God loves you very much. God wants you in communion with him. That's what he wants. God is willing even to hurt us, to punish us, to draw us back. That's what the whole idea of the shepherd is. The shepherd adds a loving comfort to the sheep. But when the sheep stray, he's willing to break their bones so that they can't stray. But then he lovingly brings them back, carries them on his shoulder till they heal up, and then he puts them back again. That's what God is willing to do to bring us to him. I'm so thankful that God loves us enough that he warns us. I'm thankful that God loves us enough that the Lord is even willing to give us spiritual swats to get our attention. Did you know sometimes the Lord is willing to do something greater than that? A friend of mine, his mom is not well. She has terminal cancer. He shared with me a story the week that he spent with his mother and his grandmother. His grandmother began to pray that God would move in one of her son's lives. He's been backslidden from the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm willing. She said, Lord, I'm willing that you'll do anything it takes to bring him back to you. 
She said, anything it takes. And she just wept. Because she knew what that meant. Are you willing to pray that prayer? God, I am willing for you to do anything it takes to put me back where you want me to be. That's a big ask, isn't it? I'd raise my hand if you asked the question, would that prayer scare you to pray it? Oh, yeah. God desires you to be in a revived condition. Lifetime of labor is still worth.